great. Good evening. And um, thanks for giving me this opportunity to be with you this evening. So I'll just be speaking to you quickly because I've got five minutes uh, about this um, diaspora office and uh, you know prior initiatives and the role of the diaspora in moving Africa you know, beyond aid and the opportunities available through engaging with the diaspora for the development of Ghana. The diaspora of any country comes with very powerful assets and they bring capital, varying skills, global spotlights, which when harnessed can help transform a nation. For Africa to move beyond aid, the nations that encapsulate the African continent have to be empowered to move beyond aid. In the spirit of leading by example, the president of Ghana set up the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda to champion the concept and the movement. President Nana Akufuado quoted, and I, and I read the quote, after 60 years of independence, it is about time Ghana stopped depending on external sources for survival. He has been touting the Africa, the Ghana Beyond Aid, that is end of quote, um, with the sources of survival. He has been touting the Ghana Beyond Aid to reduce dependency on donors and aid for Ghana's development. He has inaugurated a 13-member committee to spearhead and execute on the agenda, chaired by the senior minister, honorable advisor, now senior advisor, to the president, honorable Yao Osafomafu. Africa Beyond Aid is looking at financing the basic needs of Africa by ourselves. And it is about time that we recognize our capacity. Africa is rich in resources and over 30% of the key minerals in the world are found in Africa. The continent has a vast resource of arable and fertile land and has the greatest working population with energy, dynamism, and talent. We want young Africans to stay in Africa. And that can only happen if we move from dependence and look at how to grow our own countries. One of the key ways to achieve this through this is through the diaspora. This is exemplified in, across the three areas that the diaspora can be pivotal in the movement of Ghana, such as expertise, remittances, tourism, and um, our office believes that championing and pushing the diaspora could be a great driving force for moving Africa beyond aid. given uh, the topic of what development and economic policies have contributed to Ghana's rel uh, Africa's reliance on foreign aid. Um, what I'd like to start with is a disclaimer, which is we talk about Africa, we talk about Sub-Saharan Africa as some sort of monolithic, um, homogenous um, continent. But Africa, as we know, is um, made up of a group of very different countries, very similar, but also very different countries. And so what I'm about to talk about, though I will refer to Africa, to Sub-Saharan Africa um, quite a few times, um, I am very aware that foreign aid has had different um, impacts on different African countries. Um, and being an academic, I have to uh, have a disclaimer on that. So the debate on foreign aid has normally taken the view, two views really, which is that foreign aid is free money and that sort of free money um, prevents African countries from actually taking advantage of the opportunities there are in engaging in the global economy because it's free money. 
Um, on the other hand, others have argued that actually it's not foreign aid per se that's the problem. The problem is a misallocation of resources, corruption, bad governance, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in Africa um, that has led to foreign aid being um, problematic to Africa. My question, and I suppose the question, my question, I think, is how did we get here? And so my work here this evening is to sort of set a historical context as to how we've got to the point where we are and what has been the journey of Africa uh, getting to where it is. So um, in the 1960s and 70s, straight after independence of a lot of African countries, um, economies tended to be skeptical about free markets. And the thinking at the, t at the time was that poor countries needed a planning um, approach in order to guide resource allocation. Generally, there was a view that protectionist policies um, provided the most effective way of fostering industrialization and encouraging growth. And the planning approach actually became very um, popular on the African continent, particularly because many of the leaders of Africa had been students of the kinds of economists who thought in that direction. One example, Julius Nyerere, um, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, were all um, welded in some respects to the planning approach. This meant, of course, that the assumptions were that physical capital accumulation was a main source of economic growth. There was unlimited supplies of labor. Um, there was a fear of market failure in the terms of declining terms of trade, etc., which then led to protectionist policies. So many African governments engaged in subsidies, preferential treatments, protective import tariffs, licenses, quotas, et cetera, et cetera. The policies, therefore, led to things like the proliferation of state-owned enterprises, to the marginalization of private enterprise. Um, it was focused on aggregation of savings and investment ratios as the basic components of development strategy. And the idea was that where there was low domestic savings, this would be supplemented by foreign aid. And further, African governments were to supplement this foreign aid or whatever uh, uh, capital they had with additional resources from primary agriculture, uh, agricultural sectors such as uh, primary sectors such as agriculture, timber, mining, et cetera, et cetera. So the focus was on the export of raw materials. And the economies were designed in that way. So generally, the Generally, the economic growth theory at the time was that growth depended on capital accumulation, labor force growth, education and skills, and technological pro progress. However, come the mid-80s, there was a downturn in African economies. The planned approach had not worked for Africa. And there was a lot of blaming around uh, uh, going, a lot of blame was shared around. Generally, Africa's growth was lower than theory had predicted. Sub-Saharan Africa, at that time 48 countries, had statistically grown slower than other regions, even after taking into account all those economic variables. So what was it that was making Africa different? Was it its geography? Was it demographics, culture, resource endowment? Was it politics, internal, external politics, institutions, governance, or policies? Webster University for allowing me uh, to be here and to talk on this topic that uh, is not only very important but is also very uh, uh, I'm very passionate about uh, and so I, I'm, I'm much great, grateful. So I'm to look at the uh, contribution that the uh, African diaspora uh, can play in helping Africa break its dependency from uh, foreign aid. I think it's 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 fairly obvious that foreign aid has not uh, been very beneficial 
hasn't been beneficial at all. In fact, it's done more damage than good, I would argue, uh, for Africa. And so we, we by all means have to think beyond. Uh, not only the aid, but just think beyond money and, and finances and all. And I think the diaspora can, can do that. Uh, this issue, this question doesn't exist in a vacuum. It has some historical context, and uh, so I just want to touch on it briefly. Obviously, we don't have enough time to go into it deeply, uh, but I, if you uh, get in my course on um, Pan-Africanism or uh, African diaspora for the students who are here, we'll go into these issues more uh, thoroughly. Uh, but the point is that the African diaspora has made a, a, a very strong contribution historically over the years. Uh, it, it reached its organizational uh, formation uh, in the early 20th century. In fact, in 1900, uh, we could say, uh, the very first Pan-African Congress was uh, organized by Sylvester Williams, and of course, uh, uh, W.B. Du Bois attended that conference, that Congress, no, it was conference, uh, 1900 Pan-African Conference, and then Du Bois organized a series of Congresses in 1919, 1921, 1923, and 1927. So the point I'm trying to make is that uh, what we're asking for the diaspora to do today is not anything new. We've been doing that for for, for centuries, uh, but it again reached its organizational uh, apex uh, in 1900. Uh, this guy Sylvester Williams from Trinidad called for this conference in 1900, and. Um, Diasporans throughout the uh, uh, world were involved. And then, of course, there's Marcus Garvey from uh, Jamaica, who in uh, uh, between 1920 and 1925 organized the series of conventions uh, in New York, uh, the old Madison Square Garden. And, of course, Garvey's contribution uh, is still being felt. And we know our own president, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, was heavily influenced by, by Marcus Garvey. And uh, in fact, one of the things that uh, many people don't know is that uh, Marcus Garvey's organization, the UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association, uh, sought to uh, relieve Liberia of its debt. You may recall Liberia was formed by uh, diasporans, Africans who moved to uh, uh, that country, West Africa, and around 1840, so uh, they were uh, uh, became a republic, but they quickly fell into debt. They quickly fell into debt. It was, in fact, Liberia for years was just a ward of the U.S. government, and it was Marcus Garvey because he was so successful, because he had so much money, was prepared to uh, relieve Liberia of his debt. I wish we had more time to go into it, but uh, because Marcus Garvey and W. Du Bois were such uh, enemies, Du Bois actually undermined Garvey's effort to relieve Liberia of his debt. But that's a uh, a story for another time. But then before World War II, after World War II, not only the diasporans, but there were these temporary diasporans, because when we talk about the diaspora, we're talking about you know not just uh, those who are the uh, descendants of the transatlantic slave trade, but as uh, 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 Mr. Ababi uh, 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 mentioned, uh, those who kind of search for uh, higher education and uh, so-called greener pastures were, were there as well. And so uh, these congresses and conventions and activity, oh my God. Uh, included not just the Africans in the diaspora, but also continental-born Africans who were in the diaspora. So we're talking about two components, one diaspora, but we're talking about different components. And so, uh, and so uh, in, in Europe, in uh, UK, and in Paris, there were so many people before and after. So for example, the Fifth Pan-African Congress, which was in Manchester in 1945, was organized by diasporans, but also, I mean, the, the traditional diasporans who were a uh, product of the transatlantic slave trade, but also people like uh, Nam Namde Azikiwe, Nigeria, and, 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 and uh, Wallace, uh, uh, oh, I think Wallace Johnson, I think, from Sierra Leone was there, and Hastings Banda from Malawi was there, and of course, uh, uh, did I say Jomo Kenyatta, Kenya, uh, from Kenya, and then of course our own Kwame Nkrumah were all there. They were diasporans with intentions to return. They not only returned, but they, uh, of course, uh, led their countries. And so what we're asking for the diaspora today to help contribute to this uh, 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 breaking free of this uh, aid dependency is not new. And again, if we had more time, we could, we could talk about it, but we don't. So again, we're talking about the diaspora made up of primarily two components. 
uh, this one from the transatlantic slave trade, and of course, uh, from the late 19th century going, once colonialism gets settled, people start um, uh, uh, traveling to, uh, to uh, uh, the diaspora. Uh, and of course, this African diaspora in the 15th century is quite unique, and we should make that uh, point, I think. Most of the diasporas, Asians from China, uh, India, they came on their own volition. You know, in sociology, we have this concept of uh, uh, push-pull. Uh, maybe were conditions in their country uh, which were not uh, favorable to uh, progress and development and feeding and clothing themselves. And then there are uh, factors outside to other, in other countries that would attract them. But that's not the case with this diaspora, of course. They were forced out. And so it's very important. And it, it, it helps to explain uh, maybe the lack of uh, contribution towards uh, the liberation of Africa. Because they were not only forced out, but they were so dehumanized and, and uh, oppressed and exploited and degraded that they uh, began to see Africa as something hateful and something negative and didn't want to relate to it. And so that has to be part of, of, of discussion if we had more time. Uh, so uh, these are just some of the uh, contributions that can be made uh, uh, if you take into consideration the uh, African diaspora. And this one is very important. Uh, remittances are coming to Africa in huge in a huge in huge numbers. In fact, in some countries in Africa, the the, the remittances amount to almost uh, something like nine ten, 10 percent of the GDP. I mean, it's just a lot of money coming. But we want it earmarked. And so there are some countries, especially India, uh, Israel, who do a great job with these with this. And the whole idea is to is to get at what Dr. Forsen is saying is to reduce our dependency. So the idea is, um, you know. In other words, we, there's euro bonds, for example, but euro bonds are not helpful at all. They're very, uh, they work to the disadvantage of Africa. Uh, the interest rates are very high, and the terms of those bonds, they want the money paid back even before the project is finished for which the money was borrowed for. And so we want to break free of these euro bonds. They're not helpful at all. But diasporic bonds can be very helpful. But it, re it requires, uh, one, patriotism, Again, India and Israel are the leaders of, of these diasporic bonds. And there's some countries in Africa that do provide diasporic bonds. But much of what I have to say have to, is, is based on the assumption that Africa unites. But nonetheless, it relies on patriotism, which we have, especially amongst uh, those 19th century diasporans who, or people who were born, bred, fed in Africa and moved. The, the patriotism is there. It's less there amongst those who are the product of the transatlantic slave trade, but it's growing. But it requires a patriotism because the idea is that uh, these bonds would have a lower interest rate and more favorable terms. You don't have to pay it back, you know, in a year, that kind of thing. We have gathered here this evening in this intellectually stimulating environment to handle a critical but often under discussed subject, which is the nexus of Africans' development, aid and the inherent economic potential of our brothers and sisters in the diaspora. Um, there is a common thread that connects these three key blocks, and that is development. The post-independent African states have been striving to turn around the development narrative and pull ourselves out of widespread poverty associated with our continent in the process. In the process, Africa has been a heavy recipient of aid from more advanced economies, and the diaspora has also been providing key support. I therefore find it extremely essential that organizers of this event are bringing the importance of the diaspora to the continent's renaissance to the front burner. I want to thank the organizers for this vision as well as the opportunity to share some thoughts.
It is my expectation that this lecture will help to provide a good platform for all of us to periodically meet and reflect as we explore new and innovative ways to expedite our continent's development. Despite the trilogy of governance, aid, and diaspora support, Africa continues to lag behind on almost all development indicators. It is estimated that in 2021, 490 million in Africa lived below the poverty line across the continent. That is about 40% of the population of the continent living under $2 a day. Indeed, despite the fact that Africa accounts for only 17% of the world's population, Sub-Saharan Africa alone accounts for at least 60% of the world's poorest population. So despite the modest gains, Africa's story of underdevelopment is a worrying phenomenon. When we contrast the state of poverty and underdevelopment with the resource base of the continent, the paradoxical nature of our development discourse becomes more pronounced. For example, Africa is home to some 30% of the world's mineral reserves, 8% of the world's natural gas, and 12% of the world's oil reserves. The continent has 40% of the world's gold and up to 90% of its chromium and platinum. The largest reserves of cobalt, some of the key metals used to produce batteries the largest reserves of, of cobalt, diamonds, platinum, and uranium in the world are in Africa. Lithium and cobalt are some of the key metals used to produce batteries and phones. In 2019, about 63% of the world's cobalt production came from the Democratic Republic of the Congo alone. It holds 65% of the world's, that is Africa, Hosts 5% of the world's arable land and 10% of the planet's internal renewable freshwater resource. Despite the availability of these huge drivers, which should catalyze Africans' economic transformation from poverty to prosperity, the continent's development has been bleak, largely as a result of mal governance susceptibility of commodity prices on the global market and resource scarce that results from over concentration of efforts on selected natural resources to the neglect of other growth points. It is in this context that aid in Africa's development has remained an important part in the search for solutions. Conceptual, conceptualizing aid and Africa's development. Aid is traditionally defined as international transfer of capital, goods, or services from a country or international organization for the benefit of the resident country or its population. Essentially, aid is, is a question of resource gap. As long as the developing world is not mobilizing adequate resources internally, to meet their own development, aid will remain part of the development discourse. Aid may take different forms such as grants, concessional loans, technical assistance, and human humanitarian assistance. While inflows to Africa remain generally high, there are some few countries which are experiencing, experiencing exceptional situations. For example, in Ghana, aid has been on the declining trend since attaining middle income status. From 5.6% of GDP in 2010, aid has declined to 2.9% in 2017, with grant component shrinking from 3.7% of GDP in 2010 to 2.3% of GDP in 2017. So clearly, repositioning the continent to think strategically about alternative. And 
I had the opportunity to read Mastercard Foundation's report on secondary education. And a part of it states that by 2075, almost half of the world's population will be made up of African youth. So today, tonight we are talking about Africa beyond aid. I want to ask how we are positioning the youth to achieve the agenda. Good evening. Um, my name is Liana Kwa Bailey. I'm a student of Webster University. I'm studying international relations as a graduate student. And my question is for Dr. Cynthia Forsen. Um, so at the end of your presentation, you mentioned that beyond policy development and implementation, there's also the problem of discrimination and bad advice. So in order for Africa to develop, um, we must first disengage to an extent from the international community, regroup, and then re-engage. So my question is, considering the fact that the world is more integrated and connected than before, in your opinion, what is the most practical way for Africa to disengage from the international community with as little negative effects as possible? And what procedure can Africa use to re-engage in the international community with her own policies that will benefit the continent and her people? I also think that within Africa itself, for those who stay and are here, um, I've always argued that what colonialism did for Africa was to develop administrators people who manage other people's businesses, as opposed to entrepreneurs. And because the, the legacy of colonialism is that skills such as entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial thinking, creativity, innovation, problem solving, was essentially cut out of our education systems. You take a four-year-old, absolutely creative, by the time there are, they are uh, 16 in, let me use the school that I went to so that I'm not offending anybody. Uh, by the time they are 16 in uh, a Brie Girl Secondary School, you walk into a classroom and you say, good afternoon, and everybody in unison stands up at the same time and says, good afternoon, Dr. Forson, and then they sit down. You say something and they clap in unison. Pa, 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 together. As far as I'm concerned, that is cloning people who have started out as um, creative souls. And they get to, by the time they finish university, all the creativity has been cleaned out of them in the name of culture and tradition. And I think we do need, as educational institutions, to inculcate these skills back in our communities and back into the people of Ghana, Mali, you know, wherever. Because what makes diasporans attractive? What makes them attractive is that they've gone outside the country, apart from remittances, finance, they've developed certain skills. They're creative, they think outside the box a lot of the time because the educational system inculcates that sort of thinking in them. So I think that apart from, you know, yes, we have to add value, but you have to know where to add value. So what I'm asking in addition is not a technology transfer, but what I would term mentality transfer, or perhaps perception, perception transfer. In the advanced countries, people enter politics because they want to help the development of their nations. But over here in Africa, people enter politics because they want to make money. They think politics is the easiest way of making it. I think that perception is very dangerous. For instance, Ghana was under a military regime between 31st December 1981 to 6th January 1993. I was an activist as a student, and after some time, I was employed permanently at one of the organs of government. And we were going to return to constitutional rule in 1993. So in 1992, I was contesting as a parliamentary candidate. You know, obviously, I didn't have a car. I didn't have a house. So they were asking me questions, and I mean, very uncomplimentary remarks. You had a chance. You were in politics. You couldn't make it. Why don't you give the opportunity to another person to go and represent us? You want to go and represent us again? And people said, why well, people were putting up mansions, house mounting platforms, shouting probity and accountability. <laughs> so I see that uh, mentality of the African to be very dangerous. 
because if it's not corrected, it will be a recipe for corruption. And I think it is the duty of the diaspora to maybe set up an educational machinery to conscientize us. So at least we can be patriotic. We know we should pay tax to the nation. And the elected people, when they uh, assume office, they shouldn't think they are going there to amass wealth. Uh, why? Why is that so? Because Afri we, don't tr we don't want to trade among ourselves. So how come we have this 18%? We prefer to trade with uh, Asian countries, Europe, because of technology. Because they are big enough to be a market within themselves. Right? So, you know, if nobody bought China's stuff, I'm sure they'd have problems. But I'm sure they could sell among, you know, to each other. Do you understand what I'm saying? So my argument is that if you look at Ghana, there's 30 million people, max, maximum. If we had one district, one factory, and it was realized, how many people in Ghana could actually buy and sell those goods just within Ghana. We don't have the, the population for that. The only way to do it is to do it within Africa itself. He's a lucky winner. Okay, it's packed together. Okay, all right, so I have the first person here. In the name of Kwamesha, Kwamesha, Q-U-A-M-E-I-S-H-A. -E Are you here? Is that you? You can, you can walk up here if that's you. Right. And then let's do the second one as well, looking away. Yep, the second one. Yes. Um, so we have Nancy Lassen Sitolt. Yes, as a second winner. And lastly, why is it stuck together? <laughs> Can you, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. So we have the last winner as um, Anne Ethel Kumlaga. Okay, so a round of applause for these three. Can they walk up here? Right. So you can please walk up here one at a time. Dr. Williams, can you do this? Do us the honors to present these books by you, signed, nicely packaged. Oh, you can face the camera. Oh. Can you just try doing it again so they can take the. <laughs> Or you want me to mention the name? Oh. This book is one, and the other two are the next book. Oh, okay, all right. So uh, we have the two books that is remaining is by Kofi Annan, and the name is Know the Beginning Well. Okay, all right. Oh, the forward is by Kofi Annan. Oh yes, I'm uh, sorry about that. So the author is Rada K.Y. Amwaku and the name is Know the Beginning Well. All right, thank you so much. Oh, okay, all right. So we'll ask Dr. Forson to do the second presentation for us. of uploads. All right. And the last one by Mr. Che from 
the office of the presidency. Thank you. All right.